Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. A couple of uh, quick announcements uh, before we begin. Uh, we have our we're having a uh, barbecue, church picnic, whatever you want to call it, right after worship. So our friends at the Moravian Church are going to meet us here in the back. All right, they're going to meet us um, after their worship. They're coming over. Uh, we're going to get together and have uh, throw some uh, hot dogs, some ham uh, throw some hamburgers, and uh, just have an opportunity to sit inside because the humidity outside is going to be a wreck for my hair. I can't imagine. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's a good time for us. Uh, we're going to have some, uh, actually we're going to have some uh, outdoor games, we're going to have some little bit of cornhole, giant Jenga, just to kind of amuse ourselves as well. It's an opportunity for us just to be together. That's it. The only agenda we have today is to get to know other people. And that may mean for you in here, but also may mean for you with our friends at the Moravian Church. So uh, we look forward to doing that together, look forward to spending that time together. Uh, and so we're going to start our time of worship together, so I'm going to ask you to stand with me and sing on uh, a as you can see, Steve is not with us this morning because he was on vacation. But he's here. He's going to critique us. So make sure you sing nice and loud to make us look good. Tell the boys what a great job he Okay?
about this prayer thing. This communication that we have with God. I was, uh, probably should have been worshiping and singing with you, but I took an opportunity to text my sister. I love texting my sister. I don't see my sister as much as I'd like to. Uh, she lives in Williamstown. I live up here. It's all good. But it's neat that she and I, at any given moment, can text each other to kind of catch up on what's going on. And so while I was standing over here next to Janet and Vince, I texted her a quick message, and I began to realize how much that is kind of communication that we have with God. Difference is I don't actually have to form words. Difference is I don't actually have to know what to say. For me, it's just whatever's there. Whatever's in my head, whatever's in my heart at that moment, God gets and understands. So this morning as we pray, we don't have to think of words. We don't have to have the right kind of sense for God to hear us. We can just simply be present with God. And God gets it, He understands it, and continues to honor that by being with us no matter what's happening. So let me just spend a little bit of time in prayer. I'll be required for a little bit so we can listen. I'm going to say a few words, try to put some sentences together, make it actually sound reasonable. Let's pray. God, we enter into this time of talking to you. And God, there are so many, at least I think, or at least I believe, there are probably so much going on inside of all of us. Anticipation of what the week will be, that maybe stresses out. Maybe some concerns that we have about people that we love. Maybe there are those who are traveling who can't be with us this morning and God that you're worried about where they are and where they're going and when uh, and how they're when they're going to come back. Or maybe God it's just the day to day of just living this life with all that is happening within us. God we, we pray and we ask and we communicate and we, a lot of ways God will do. Not so much to make sense of what we see and what is going on around us, but God, that you would just continue to remind us that you would make us very aware that, God, you are with us. That, God, nothing, absolutely nothing, God, and we are grateful for this, that, God, we are grateful that absolutely nothing separates us from you and nothing separates you from us. That, God, that you are present with us in every moment of every day. That, God, no matter what the circumstances may be. So, God, at this moment, God, we can take a moment to pause. And so, friends, we take this moment to pause and just think about those who are in our heads and our hearts right now, God, who God are in Friends who are in need of healing. Those who are in need of grace for their journey. For those, God, who are for us, friends, that we know that so desperately they need this faith, this uh, dependence on you. So God, we surrender all that to you. Knowing, God, that there is nothing that we have the ability to do on our own in our encounter and our approach to you. 
that God, in everything that we do, God, we need to be reminded of the fact that God, you are there, and that God, you have a greater vision of what we do. And so, God, we pray that when we talk to you, we pray to you that we would relinquish, relinquish our worry and our control of the situation, and that God, we would approach those circumstances, whatever they may be, in trust. This trust, God, that we know that, God, we need from you. God, this gift of faith that, God, we absolutely need from you. And so, God, no matter where we may be in our journey, God, no matter where we may be with all that we may be experiencing, God, remind us of who you are. Remind us that, God, you love us this much. Take care of whatever may be present. So God, for those relationships, for those who are struggling with addiction, for those who, God, who are in need of your healing, for those, God, who need to be sustained, for those, God, who need to know your grace, God, for those who need to know that you are real, God, for those who are in need of your justice, for those, God, that we see that we are overwhelmed with when we watch the news for the for the children of not just our community but all throughout the world for our students our young men and women who have to make difficult decisions every day that God they would be very aware of you and that God you love them and that God you care for them and that God enable us to act and respond with this gift of grace to those around us with that same gift of grace. And so God, we pray all of this in your son's name. And friends, on the screens next to me are these the Lord's prayers. So let's turn them on. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So a couple quick announcements. Again, uh, we have a barbecue after this. It's just an opportunity for us to be together. Again, our only agenda is to be with one another. Maybe one of the few times in our week that we can be fully present with somebody else without needing to be worried about what anybody else around us is going to think. We can actually be fully present without needing to start a conversation. So it's our opportunity to be fully present with others in our congregation and also in our first, our friends who are at the First Moravian Church as well. Um, we are um, also in support of Loads of Love. You'll see a Thai pod container out in the um, lobby and in that lobby you just Hey, if you have change in your pocket, which I don't have anymore, but you do. You got change that kind of muddles around at the bottom of your purse, which I know does happen. If there's change that you have in your car that you've just been look, looking at and say, I can either buy a soft pretzel at the Mart in Cinnamon or I can take the change in there and put it in the pod container. I'm asking you to put it in the container. Uh, the Lords of Love is a ministry that happens um, once a month at the uh, laundromat in Riverside on over by Vids Deli. Uh, what it does is it basically from six to eight, we provide change. Basically we're just pumping Washington, washing machines, dryers full of change so that the people who come and bring their clothes there won't have to pay for it at that point. It's a wonderful ministry because what it requires, or what it requires from us, whoever's there, a couple things. You begin to know people by their name, you begin to listen to their story, and then they know through our presence, full presence with them, this grace. So it's ministry that expands the kingdom of God, that brings God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Which is pretty funny, right? When you think about it, the significance of that. 
is this idea that when we get, when we're in the presence of God fully and in all of eternity, we get clean clothes. And so we're providing opportunity for some folks to have some clean clothes. So we have that going on. Um, we have a barbecue, we have vacation Bible school happening at the Moravian Church. Uh, August 5th through the 9th, uh, starting at 8.30 a.m. We have this upcoming week, our students, uh, some of our students will be actively involved in doing some ministries, uh, opportunities uh, just being present in their community in Riverside as well as Blanco, and us just kind of being there, doing some work, uh, taking pride in our two communities. Uh, we are working uh, on Tuesday, we are working on Monday tomorrow at the House of Good Council. Now, the House of Good Counsel is a place for moms to come because they don't have a home for them and their babies. So the kids that are there, we're going to go and we're going to do our very best job cleaning up the yard, making it look presentable, but not so much presentable for us. It doesn't matter what It's going to give them an opportunity to feel loved by the woman. We'll be doing some other things like that throughout our community, so we look forward to that. Um, if you have students who want to be actively involved in that, we will meet at the Moravian Church at 8.30. Kids get some breakfast foods. Uh, we do a little time of just uh, devotion, and then we'll do our, our, our community mission trip part, and then we'll come back and have lunch together. So, free water, if you're going, it's free lap. We'll provide water as well. Uh, just some opportunities that we have coming up this week. So, I'm um, gonna, Mr. and Mrs. Pete, I'm going to ask you to meet our children in the back. In the back. Uh, Natalie, you're going the wrong way. All right, uh, kids, can meet Mr. and Mrs. Pete in the back for Sunday school. Uh, next Sunday at 1030, um, we will have the privilege and the honor of having Timothy Noble here to lead our time of worship and as well as our singing. And it'll be an opportunity for us to really uh, connect with God and everything that God is and always will be. So that'll be there next week. So I'm going to ask those who are collecting our offering this morning to come at this time and collect our offering. Uh, our offering, as you well know, does more than what you see with a cool environment on a very humid day. It provides opportunities for our students to come and have a space and a place to call their own. It's for our Sunday school kids who come, not only for vacation Bible school, but also meet downstairs uh, for Sunday school. It's an opportunity for us to do ministry together with the Moravian Church when it comes to not only their vacation Bible school, but also our vacation Bible school, to do barbecues, but to also to have a community outreach meeting like tonight coming up in, in October, uh, Easter egg hunt over at our, our elementary school. But more than that, it gives us the privilege and honor to connect in relationship with those in our community. So that's why we do church. That's why we're here. That's why we collect the offering. We provide um, monies as well uh, for the different missionaries that operate throughout the world. Check it out in your bulletin. We're supportive of uh, John and Dasha, who are in Poland, they have several different ministry opportunities. They're doing camps all throughout the summer. Some of it has been English camps, but also there have been uh, camps uh, for kids with special needs. And just opportunity after opportunity for kids in Poland, in their area of Poland, to come to know uh, Jesus as the Lord and So we, we are privileged and honored to uh, partner with them. Stand with me as we sing, and you'll see on the screens next to me, oh. uh, Rock of Ages. <laughs>
during where people feel like they need to leave during that game. Uh, people are going to prep for the barbecue, that's why they left. I don't want you to get any funny ideas about leaving now during my message. We all stay for Dave and the band and the song and actually meet, you know, talking about the offering. So you all can stay for this. So. Um, go ahead, Dave. Anybody know what this place is? This is Gettysburg. This is where they fought the battle of Gettysburg. 50,000 men died right here on this field. Fighting the same fight that we're still fighting amongst ourselves today. This green field right here, painted red. Bubbling with blood, young boys, smoke, and hot lead pouring right through their bodies. Listen to their soul, man. Kill my brother with malice in my heart. Hatred destroyed my family. You listen. We don't come together right now on this hollow ground. We too will be destroyed. Let's talk, baby. I don't care if you like each other right now, but you will respect each other. And maybe, and maybe you'll learn to play this game like me. wrote these words and it let 
that was not so much designated for us, but probably somehow, some way, the Holy Spirit knew. That we would need to hear these words just as much as they needed to hear the words way back when. So here are the words, and I'm going to start out with just, I'm going to read a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit, read a little bit, talk a little bit. But notice how John opens this part of his letter, or the writer who wrote these words in John's community. Dearly beloved, let us love one another. Because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And so there's this, a, there's this beginning part of this part of this letter. So we're coming kind of in midstream in this letter, right? And so in midstream, John uses the word love and creates a noun and creates it in a way to say basically, those that I love, I need you to listen. He uses an affectionate name. He uses the word agape love to describe his feeling, uh, not just feeling, but his, his response to those around him. So he takes a noun, and then eventually, what we see later on, he calls them my loved ones, or dearly beloved, my loved ones. He goes from using a noun to a verb. Let us love one another. Because love comes from God. Now, it's pretty unique about this part of this letter. He starts out with that, and then he ends with that as well. And so he does this complete turnaround, not turnaround, but he does this kind of a circle, right? He starts at the top of the circle, comes right back around to the top of the circle again. And so he does this purposely because he's really emphasizing this idea that no matter what goes on in our lives, we must what? Love one another. Now, it's, what's significant about this is he's telling the church. He's not saying you have to love the others, which we know we need to do. But that we first love one another. Because God first loved us. What I find significant in this part is that everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So there's this intimate relationship that goes on between God and us and us and God. And, there, and the writer here saying, if you love, people will know this about you. They'll know that you are in relationship to God. And know God, and God knows you in a very real way. And then verse 8 says, whoever does not love, and you're all sitting there saying, this is pretty easy to hear, I know this, right? Pretty simple, right? Whoever does not love, does not know God. And here's what's significant about that part of that verse in verse 8. He says, for God is love. It doesn't say love is God, right? Because if we identify love is God, we would identify that idea of love through our own idea of what love is. So God reassigns this idea that God is love, meaning God is the one who defines how we love. Now, if we were to look at the character of who God is, what would we see? We would see that love is sacrificial. That love is defined in how we approach people or initiate a relationship with people. Love would be seen as love that dies to self and not so concerned or consumed about myself as more, more concerned and consumed about the other person. So God redefines for that culture what love is. To quote far from the 80s. I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. God, the writer of this particular letter, I know I'm the only one who's from the 80s right now. 
I know why that didn't connect with you, but it did connect with me and my heart and my soul. This idea that God redefines what love is. See, what's significant about this is that love isn't fleeting, but remains. That love isn't just a feeling that we get when we see somebody or know somebody. But that love is a decision that God easily made and willingly made for us, for humanity, for the ones that he created and created in God's own image. And so if we have a struggle in how we love, it's not because God isn't loving us. It's because we're getting in our own way. Because God is love. Anyone who loves is born of God, or to use the lingo of the 70s and 80s when it comes to being in relationship with God, you born again Christians. Those who have been reborn in relationship to God, love, everyone who loves is reborn of God. Now, you all know I've been saying that in the last couple of weeks, right? I've been doing a series of sermons on how to live and what does it mean to live, and this is what I mean, that we love our neighbors, right? And that's a significant part of what we are. But what's significant about this is that John's not writing about our neighbor, meaning those in our community. John's actually writing to say, you Christians better get it right. You followers of Jesus Christ better get it right, because God He is talking about how we are to love one another so that God's love will be revealed in us, that constant, consistent, knowing kind of love that is sacrificial, unconditional, and always fully present. Why? Why would he say this to a church of people who are supposed to get it right? Why? Because he knew that we struggle to love one another because we have an expectation of one another that is different than the only expectation that we have of ourselves. See, what's significant about this is that John is placing on them saying, my expectation is that this love that you have received from God needs to be given well. Because how is everybody else outside of this going to know about who God is? But it starts with who God is, right? See, that's what's significant about the story that John has. This, this scripture, this, this nerdiness, I kind of get a little jacked up with. This nerdiness of this scripture that in verse 9, this is the source of that love. Right? So we can't do it on our own. We know it's impossible, right? Go on a mission trip with a bunch of other Christians and you will find out quickly how much, how difficult it is to love one another. Getting to a meeting where you disagree with somebody else within the church and you will find out, friends, how much you have a hard time, difficult time loving one another. Talk about different ways of worshiping God on a Sunday morning with a bunch of Christians. You will find out how difficult it is to love one another. The Methodist Church at General Conference and at our annual conference, got, the world around us got to witness how difficult it is for us to love one another when we disagree. And let me tell you something, friends. That's because we forgot about first time. Verse 9 says, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. I love that. Live through him. Because, so in other words, I can't do this on my own. I can't love my, my brothers and sisters in Christ unless first I realize that God sent his son into the world. John chapter 1, verse, um, verses 14 15 and 16, or uh, 14, 16, 17, and 18. And, the, and this would be reminiscent to those who are in this community that when 
when this was said, they would go back to what was originally said with the Gospel of John. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. And from His fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. You know, you want to know how you add to your number here? You want to know how you add to the number of people in any congregation, anywhere, at any time? It's not having the best fans. It's doing it well. It's when people know that they can love, they can come in here and know that they're loved. Love them. Because verse 9, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live. And in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice of our sins. We have to cross up every single week because we don't want anybody to make the mistake of knowing what we stand for and what we what we cling to, as Rock of Ages said. The cross of Jesus Christ is in the utmost the foundation of what we believe and why we believe. It's, it's what enables us, it's what compels us to be who we are in love with God and in love with one another. It's the very thing that, that shows us and exemplifies the unseen God through Jesus. This atoning sacrifice. This word atonement is, as my mom used to tell me when I was a kid, atonement means this. It means at one with God. Which in other words means I can't do this on my own unless I'm at one with God. And God's the one who made the initiation, initiated that relationship with God so I wouldn't have to do it on my own. That I didn't have to go after God. God came after me and initiated that relationship with God. And the only thing I had to do was trust. So this idea of atoning sacrifice or atonement or it means a reconciliation of a broken relationship. Our relationship with God was broken. It didn't make sense. We couldn't live. We weren't living. We weren't living the way that God wanted us to live. We weren't pursuing the path that God has given us to pursue God. And so Jesus said, or God said, I'm going to send my son Jesus and he's going to die on the cross and be resurrected so that everything that was broken in God's relationship with us would no longer be broken. So there's a reconciliation that goes on, which I think is kind of cool because it talks about that there. But I also believe that the reason why there's, this is mentioned in the atoning work of Christ, it means our atoning sacrifice for our sins. This idea means that there are things in our lives that we need reconcile with others. See, that's a whole part of that love thing. It means reconciliation with others. So he leaves that in there purposely and says, in this love, not that we love God, but that he, God loved us. So God initiates. God sent his son to be the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice for our sins so that nothing would ever get in the way of God's love for us and our love for God. I love this quote from Brother Manuel writing about the gospel. God is not, is not moody or capricious. Ever see me in the morning before I have my coffee, you'll know what moody is. God knows no seasons of change. God has a single, relentless stand for us. God loves us. God is the only God man has ever heard of who loves sinners. The verse 11 says, Beloved, again, my friends that I love, I need you to listen, please. Since God loved us so much, talk to any mom or any aunt or any parent or any grandparent or anyone who has or has a connection with kids, you hear this I love you so much kind of moment constantly. Now think of the parental influence or the parental God, this Father God who says, since, or the writer says, since God loved us so much, since God has willingly give us, given us his love, since God's work of forgiveness and grace and salvation is completed there, 
that God doesn't need to go to the cross constantly for our sin. That he's that the work that that's the sin that separated us from God and God from us is now forgiven and forgotten and released and it's completed there. Since God loved us that much, that God was willing to try to save all of the world around us and not just those who are here right now. We also ought to love one another. And this is but this is the crazy part of the verse, right? This is the crazy part of it. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. In other words, if we love, notice the word if. I don't know if John just wasn't being hopeful or optimistic, or if John woke up without his coffee. But John said if, and so John knew the human condition. John knew that churches would break up and break down. Because we didn't have this ability to love one another. So John knew that if we love one another, if we can love one another, if we disagree but still love one another, those who do not have a connection with Christ or a church will see that God lives in. See, that was my, my, that's my thing, right? Isn't that what I'm supposed to do? Right? I'm supposed to leave you? To grow you up? So that you can love one another? So that no matter where we stand on any kind of issue, no matter where it may be in our conversations with other people, and what we may believe or see happen in the general church and general conference, no matter what their stand is with human sexuality, we can still love one another. I mean, seriously. John knew that there would be issues that would trip us up. God knew through John, through the Holy Spirit, that there would be things that would trip us up. And so, he was saying that no, no one has ever seen God if... I wish John put in there since. I really did. Be a little bit more. But John knew that we wouldn't get it right. And that there would be division. And so he writes, if we love one another, God lives in us. He will see that God lives in us. If we love one another, it will be evident that God lives in us. And that God, notice this, what he writes. This is crazy. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love, God's love, is perfected in us, or completed in us, or is made completed, or whole in us. Notice what has to happen. We have to first have this relationship with God for it to work, right? Because God loved us so much that we ought to love one another. But if you notice something about this right here in verse 12, if we love one another, and God, because God lives in us, God's love will be perfected in us in our response to our neighbors, to the people around us. Notice that. Our God's love will be completed in how we approach and love other people. So God takes the most unlikeliest of people and says, says to them, no matter what you do, no matter what gifts you have, no matter where you're going, no matter, no matter what happens, love. Love always. Love significantly. Love well. I wonder what and how life would be if we realize that the truth of God's scripture is to instruct us on how to love. I wonder if the authority of Scripture would shape us and form us to be more like Jesus in how we love one another. Brian Peterson, 
writes, failure to love one's brother or sister is a sure sign that one does not truly know or love God. Much of the anger that erupts within the church under the banner of loving God and defending God's truth often seems to grow instead from the love of self. You ever like read something and then reread something and then like read something again and then reread something again and then you realize, wow, I, I missed that part? So within the church under the banner of loving God and defending God's truth often seems to grow instead from love of self and of the power that comes from winning the argument even at the expense of church's unity and love. That's why John wrote this, by the way. Here's probably what, how many are here? Over 40, 50 people this morning? It doesn't matter how many people here. There could be five of you here and still preach the same message, the same kind of passion, fire, and You know why? Because it really doesn't matter what I say. It's how you will respond to what God says in God's Word and how you will be with everyone else out there, including the people here, including the people who disagree with you, including the people that you think are theologically different than. Trust me, I am theologically different than my mom and dad, which is fine. I'm good with that. They're good with that. They love me. I'm their son. Of course they love me. They have to love me. But we'll never respond to each other out of love of self, more out of the love of God. My sister and I are completely different theologically. We are completely different when it comes to the realm of what we believe is in the scriptures. But we still love each other. I'm texting her during church. Are you kidding me right now? We may not agree politically, because you know what? When you call yourselves conservative evangelicals, the conservative part is political. The evangelical is what you believe about the cross and a personal relationship with Christ. I think I'm more modern progressive than I am the evangelical. However, I still believe in a personal relationship with God, and I believe in the cross and the resurrection as my foundation, because of that is why I can do what I do. And because of that, I'm saved, and sanctified, and forgiven, and regenerated. And I'll use all the Western terms that you need to have. But just because I see people differently than you doesn't make me wrong any more than it makes you wrong. Because here's what I know about this, friends. No matter where we may stand politically or emotionally or theologically, this is the one thing that we have to know more than anything else. And you have to get this through into your hearts. We will not be the church if people, all people, don't matter. All people matter to God, no matter where they are. No matter what's going on in their lives. No matter if you believe it's a choice or you're born this way. We are in love. No matter what. And the best way to do that is this. I told you I'm a nerd, right? I love good quotes. I love the story behind quotes. I love good music lyrics. Because I love the story behind the music lyrics. I love a good story. So this past week, we did loads of love. We had a meeting with loads of love. And we were sitting around and we were talking about this one thing. We were talking about the fact that there was somebody who was coming in. Because it goes from 68. Where some of the folks there believed that some, they were taking advantage of everybody's good graces by doing not just their laundry, but somebody else's laundry, and then somebody else's laundry, and then gathering up all the laundry from their apartment complex and coming in and, and taking advantage of us. And I looked at them and said, what's the big deal? They're like, what do you mean? Isn't that grace? I'm like, what do you mean? That like, grace is undeserved, unreserved love. We don't deserve it, but we still get it. And then this is what I said to them. And this is significant. I need you to hear me on this. I said, do you know the name of the person that you believe is taking advantage of you? They're like, no. Like, All right, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, by the way, I can do two things at one time, so I'm playing Candy Crush on my phone while I'm talking. I'm only saying that to impress you, by the way. That's the only reason why I'm saying that. 
But then I said this, and you know that person's story. You know their story. You know their name. It doesn't really matter. So friends, to love somebody means that you want to know their story. And you want to know them by name. People will know that you are, that, they, that they're loved by you, or will be loved by you, because you have an ability to love and love, and that love comes from you. And so I'm going to ask you this question. If you have a hard time loving the people around you, you're having a hard time loving people who are theologically different than you or politically different than you, then I'm going to ask you this simple question. How much do you really trust God? How much do you really know God? How, do you really, I mean, if you read the scriptures, you can't help but see that love means everything to God. You know, love is our defining mark of who we are, the maturity of that's the crazy part about it. Like, how much we love shows how mature we are and how complete we are and who we are in relationship with God. So, let's see. If that was a challenge. Oh, challenge is love is not a gift to hoard. What we do with this gift. Oh, this is the one I want to remind all of you about, remind myself. Who will you love without distinction? Who we love without judgment? Who we love without labels? Who you love no matter what, who they are? See, the maturity and the evolution of your faith is determined by who you love. So the crazy part about the good news of this is that God will choose the most unlikely to reveal God's love if you are willing and available to go where God is at. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. My name's going to play for us and we're going to sing, uh, I think we're just going to sing the first verse uh, of Nothing But the Blood. So let's stand together and we'll sing this together. Thank you.